The fourth video in this series introduces underdamped systems. So a reminder of what we were doing. We were focusing on second order differential equations of the form shown here, a d2x dt squared plus b dx dt plus cx equals f, and asking ourselves how the behavior of x of t depends upon the parameters a, b, and c. And we might, for example, want to produce a rapid sketch or impression of what x of t looks like. Now, this particular video is going to focus on scenarios where x of t has got some oscillatory components, some sinusoids within it. How do we ensure that we have sinusoids in the solution? Well, I've rewritten the differential equation there so you can see what it is. Now, if you force b squared, this parameter b, to be less than 4ac, then you can show that the roots of the characteristic equation, which are, is ap squared plus bp plus c equals naught, are complex. You'll see here, the roots are given as p equals alpha plus and minus j beta. So as long as b squared is less than 4ac, then the characteristic equation will have complex roots. And therefore, this system, represented by a second order ODE, will have an oscillatory component in the solution. How would we write that solution? Well, there's several different ways you can write it, and I've shown three ways here for completeness. You could write it in terms of a sign. So that's this one here, I've circled in red, x equals 1 over c plus a e to the minus alpha t. So you'll notice the alpha bit in the exponential comes from the real bit of the root. And then you've got sine beta t plus phi. So the beta here, the complex bit of the root, tells you the frequency of oscillation. And if I write it as a sine, you'll notice I have to include this phi because I'm not quite sure what phase we'll have. Alternatively, you might say, I don't want to use a sine, I want to use a cosine. So if you do that, which is what I've got here, you'll notice the exponential bit's the same, a different constant, but you've got b e to the minus alpha t. Same frequency, obviously, beta t, but a different phase shift. Now, I hope it's obvious to you that a sine beta t plus phi has got to be the same as b cos beta t plus gamma. Now, the final alternative which some people might prefer, is instead of having just a sine or just a cosine with a phase shift, you could write it as sine plus cosine. Again, you'll notice both of them have this frequency beta, but now I've absorbed the constants, um, a different constant for the sine, there's capital C, and a constant for the cosine, that's D. Now, in all cases, you'll see we have two unknowns. We could have the unknowns A and phi, the unknowns B and gamma, or the unknowns C and D. And we solve for these unknowns using the initial conditions. If we have two initial conditions, we can solve for two unknowns. An example then to show how this might happen. We've given ourselves this ODE, x double dot plus 2x dot plus 2x equals 1. And we, first of all, we've said, what's the characteristic equation? There it is. It's p squared plus 2p plus 2 equals 0, which has solutions p equals minus 1 plus or minus j. I notice that the roots of the characteristic equation are complex, and therefore I recognize I must have sines or cosines or both in my solution. So I write the general solution, bearing in mind what I've put in for p here, and here it is. I've got the 1 over c, which corresponds to the steady state, and in this particular case, you'll notice that that's going to be a half. You can see that because we've got a 2 up here and a 1 here. Now I put my general solution. I've got some constant, a, then e to the minus t, the minus t, because in my p, you'll notice the real part is minus 1. And then I have my sine, t plus phi, and you'll notice the frequency is 1, because I've just got j as this pole. Alternatively, I could have b, e to the minus t, cos t plus gamma. What I'm going to do next, then, is put in the initial conditions and see what happens. So I've given two initial conditions. I've assumed they're both 0, as with all of these videos in this series. x of 0 equals 0. I plug that in, and I get a half plus a e to the minus t sine t plus phi. And at x of dot equals 0. Now, when I differentiate, you'll notice I get minus a e to the minus t sine t plus phi plus a e to the minus t cos 
t plus phi. Now you'll notice I haven't put the value t equals zero yet into the right hand side because I wanted to make it clear what the initial conditions were and where they were being substituted and what I'm going to do now is I'm going to substitute t equals zero as expected into these two expressions and see what I get. So the first line then, that's this one up here. If I put t equals zero, this is what I get. Minus a half equals a sine phi. The second one, that's one here, the one with the derivative. If I put in t equals zero, I end up with this. a sine phi equals a cos phi, from which by inspection I can write phi equals pi by four. Now, having done that, I can, of course, put this value in here because I now know what phi is. And so if I do that, then what I've done next, if it's not obvious, is I've taken this expression here, I've rewritten it here, but I've substituted in the known value of phi, which is pi by 4. So what I get is a sine pi by 4, which is a over root 2, and that was minus 0 0.5. So I can solve for a a is minus 1 over root 2. The second example then, and we'll do this one just writing on the screen so you can see what's going on. So first of all, I need the characteristic equation. So I can write p squared plus 6p plus 10 equals 0 implies that p equals minus 3 plus or minus j. And therefore, I can write my general solution as x equals 4 over 10. Hopefully you can see where the 4 over 10 comes from, uh, from the steady state condition. Plus a, and the exponential is going to be e to the minus 3t, because the minus 3 is the real part of the root. And then I'm going to get sine t plus phi. Again, the frequency is 1, because I've just got j as the complex root. Next, I'm going to substitute in initial condition. So x of 0 is going to give me 4 over 10 plus a sine phi. So that's my first initial condition. The second initial condition, I've got x dot of 0. So what I'll get here is minus 3a sine phi plus a cos phi. Now if I rearrange this second one, then what you'll see, I hope this is um, obvious to you, is you've got tan phi equals 1 over 3. And that tells you that sine phi equals 1 over root 10. If you can't do that quickly, just draw a right angle triangle with opposite of 1 and adjacent of 3, and you'll see it's obvious. So now what I can do is I can take this solution, and I can pop it in here. And so what I've got is minus 4 over 10 equals a into 1 over root 10, which tells me that a equals minus 4 over root 10. So I've now solved this problem for zero initial conditions. This page has got some examples for you to try. So I'm just showing the page long enough for you to press the pause button so you can write them down and give them a go. Right Now I'm going to move to the next slide. Don't look at this until obviously you've tried them. So the hints here are really to point out where the roots of the um, characteristic equation are. So you'll see I've listed all the roots. Some of them, indeed, you might like to note, um, have positive real parts. Uh, the solution will apply whether you have positive or negative real parts. Some conclusions, then. We've illustrated the solution of second-order ODEs when the input is a step and the system includes oscillatory modes. Generally, students should be able to characterize the solutions quickly, as the detailed algebra that we've maybe gone through here might not be asked in an examination, and certainly not 
in a real engineering scenario, but people would expect you to be able to characterize things quickly and say, roughly what do I expect? What sort of exponential behavior have I got? What sort of frequency of oscillation? Now we've used zero initial conditions because that's fairly common in control scenarios, which is the main focus of these videos. But students might, for completeness, like to do some examples using non-zero initial conditions. And you can use the MATLAB desolve.m um, file to check your answers. There are some videos in this series on the use of MATLAB which cover the use of desolve. And that's quite good because it means you can make up your own examples, try them on paper, and then try them on MATLAB to see if you've got the right answer.